Today I'm going to chat about the Volantex or Sonic RC 400mm model planes, Esheen also make them. These are really good trainers, park flyers, they're just so much fun even if you're an experienced flyer because you don't have to worry about them, they're pretty risk free, it's hard to damage them, it's not impossible. And this video is about how to fly them and some hints and tips. Now, one of the tips is I put my phone number underneath the model planes. And I know some people with larger planes who don't. And I don't know why really, perhaps they don't want to be responsible if something happens. But I think you should be responsible and nothing's going to happen really with a little plane like this. It weighs 60 grams, all up weight with the one cell 3.7 volt, 400 milliamp hour battery. 60 grams and 250 grams is the weight limit before you have to take the online exam. I've done that exam and yeah, I know the rules. The thing is, these are just safer than, say, someone who kicks a football around. There's less momentum in this model, it can hit you at the speed it flies. It, these have hit me and they just don't hurt. So, they're safe really. Great little idea and the technology has only become possible in the past few years because they have what some people call safe technology, six axis gyro stabilization, they call it X-Pilot. And that means that the plane will automatically level. It will try and find level flight when that mode is on. And that is really useful, so if you're in trouble, just come off the controls and it will level out. Now, you can't get it to hover, it won't necessarily not fly into a wall or fly over a fence or something, but it will at least level out. So that is a really good feature and it enables the plane to combat gusty wind conditions and things like that. And that means you can fly the plane, not fight it. That's important. Now the two modes where X-Pilot is on are beginner mode and mid mode. And that is beginner mode. And if you pull that switch to the middle, that is mid mode. There is expert mode. And now it has the stabilization off and it is now totally under your control. And they're much harder to fly like that. Fly on a non-windy day, I can fly like that. The one that was trimmed the best out of the box was the BF109 for me. And I flew that for over a minute on expert mode. But every now and again you have to catch it here, fighting the wind a little. And I think it's much easier in mid or beginner mode to fly these planes. Certainly launch in one of those modes with stability on, it just helps. You can launch in expert mode, it's just harder. But it's an unnecessary challenge because planes this small do need a little help in gusty conditions. So that's why they need some stabilisation. Then they will actually respond to your inputs and fly. And really that's what you want to do is fly and have fun. So here's the transmitter that they all come with. You can buy a separate transmitter if this was to break. And incidentally, if you want to then bind the transmitter, the new transmitter to your plane, you put the plane on first by plugging the power pack in, and then you switch on the transmitter, and that will bind the new transmitter to your plane. It's all in the instructions. But normally, you switch the transmitter on first and the transmitter off last, so you always have control of your plane. There is no power cut on these transmitters, so you can't cut the throttle off. And that means it's easy to knock that and get that prop to spin round, which won't hurt or anything, but it is just a bit annoying, so be mindful of that. These are your four channel controls here, you have two sticks. Your throttle one is always in the down position. This is called mode two incidentally with the throttle on the left hand side. It's mode one if the throttle is on the right hand side. So that is your throttle control. Full throttle, 50% throttle, no throttle. 
This also controls your rudder or your left and right. You don't have to use the rudder that much actually unless you want tighter turns. But three channel systems just have aileron, elevator and throttle and they dispense with the rudder. So this is the other side, the other stick, that is always central on mode 2. That's your aileron left, aileron right for turns and then your elevator. So if you push it up that will dive the plane, pull it back, that will climb the plane. Just as pulling the stick back on a real aircraft will climb the plane. That's the idea of that. You do have little trim buttons that you can push a click or two and they very slightly move the control surfaces on the model to get them level if they're not quite level. But I would always say fly it as it is out the box even if it looks odd and trim it after that if you need to. I've never had to trim any of mine. There's also an aerobatics button here and if you touch that once it will beep and then you can pull back on the stick to do a loop but you have to be very precise with that otherwise it will think you're turning left or right and perform a roll so if you go like that it's going to do a roll instead so you have to be really precise on a downward movement to get it to do a loop or you can do left and right rolls to your heart's content all day long and it will level out beautifully it executes them perfectly you can do movements like that in expert mode and in mid mode you will be able to do a loop but it will prevent you from doing a roll it just restricts the movement of the plane and in beginner mode it restricts the movement of the plane so much you cannot do a loop or a roll using the stick you have to use the aerobatics button it takes four double A's I always mark up each transmitter for each plane Corsair. You can, as I say, reset them by putting on the plane first and then the transmitter and binding them that way. Now the Corsair, Mustang and Trojan do not have inspection hatches, but later models such as the Spitfire Warhawk and 109 and probably the Zero, they do and that enables you to get into the motor and gearbox if you need to and also another inspection hatch here will let you get into the circuit board and rudder and elevator servos and also the aileron servo. The aileron servo you can get to here anyway. It has some strengthening struts and these areas are for putting on the undercarriage if you wish to. Now I don't anymore, I used to and it's good if you want to do landings and takeoffs. But I've found that with the Spitfire, it crash landed once at full throttle into the ground, and the undercarriage stopped it from belly flopping down. And that cracked the nose here. My son performed exactly the same stunt without undercarriage, and the plane survived lovely. He didn't do that deliberately, he just happened to crash into the ground, as you do. And his one survived. And I thought, you know what, the wheels actually did more harm than good on that occasion. So now I don't fly with the wheels on, but my early models have had the wheels on. Some of the proportions of these models are a little bit out, but I can forgive them for that because they need to fly. Usually the main wing is set back a little, and some of the tailplane services are a little larger than those therefore because of the main wing position might appear a little longer. But overall, they always captured the overall look of the plane. The colours are a little bit different to how I might model them, but they're still good. They're okay. But you can respray these models with water based acrylics, Vallejo paints I use, and they're really good. They won't eat into the foam, but you have to try that first on a little piece of foam just to make sure the paint is not going to eat into it, or the glue for that matter. I also, when I'm on the field, I have some spare parts, things that I like to take. One of the things I take out in the field with me is a lipo meter. You can get these online very cheaply. And these are for measuring the power pack. 
voltage. So this one is at 3.84 volts. And that is ideal for storage, 3.8 volts is where you want your LiPo cells to be. And I also number all of my batteries so I can cycle them. You put them on the left hand side of the LiPo meter and if you put it on the wrong way, nothing will happen. So you won't damage anything. Let's try this power pack. It says all of them are 3.85 and cell 1 is 3.85 because there's only one cell here. This can measure up to 8 cells. And so these power packs are perfect now for storing after 7 minutes of flight. Now you can fly them for about 15 minutes. You'll run them right down to very low voltage, 3.2 or something, and you really need to store them a little bit higher than that. If LiPo's get under 3 volts, it's not healthy for them. 3.8 gives them quite a little bit of energy in there just to keep them going, keep them alive, and so you can store them like that for a few months and they should still be usable. If ever a battery goes puffy, you need to dispose of that safely, find out how to dispose of batteries in your local area. Because puffy batteries indicate that the chemicals are breaking down inside, it's creating gas and that's not a good thing. It's when you charge these batteries, they may even catch fire. Now these probably won't explode, they're so small, but they might catch fire. So charge them on a glass plate or a ceramic dish or a, a tin that you cook in, something like that, just in case something was to catch fire. It's very, very low risk actually, but nevertheless, good practice. Now these are the glues that I use for repair. For gluing the foam, I just use regular Yoohoo. You can buy that very cheaply. It's a contact adhesive, but you can also get a product called Yoohoo Pour, this is a rubbery sort of Yoohoo and that is useful for gluing the aileron joints because these need to move so if ever they break use a bit of Yoohoo pour. That's the only time I use this glue and I've only had to use it once on a sport car. I've got 15 of, or I bought 15 of these planes. I've given two away and I now have two sport carbs, four Spitfires, two Warhawks, one I converted into an RF Kitty Hawk, two Mustangs, one I repainted into a different Mustang, a Corsair and a Messerschmitt BF109, and all I want now really is the Zero that I'll repaint into a sort of white grey colour, and Perhaps a Trojan, just to complete the set, I don't know. It's not really a World War II plane though, it's 1949, so for me it doesn't quite sit with the others. They all pretty much fly the same. There are some very slight differences, but they're extremely subtle. I think you would notice the differences more on larger flying models, but with these, I can honestly say they're all pretty much the same. So if you like one, just buy the one you like, the look of. The Mustang does seem to glide a little bit better at slower speeds and will land therefore a bit smoother. Some of the others they just drop out the sky as they suddenly stall. But that doesn't matter, they're not going to get hurt. And the one that flew the best in expert mode was trimmed perfectly straight away out the box was for me the 109. But really, there's nothing in them. I like the Spitfire for its iconic looks. I like the Warhawk for its fantastic looks. But that was teeth. Just a sharp mouth is fantastic. They're all nice in their own way. And they all represent different parts of flying history. So I'm going to paint up a little damage there. I'm mixing up several colours to get the correct shade. 
So a little bit of blue, a little bit of black, a little bit of red. See, it's slightly purpley. I mean, this colour I've got actually is very close. And the colour I've got is McCrag blue. But the black and the red, it could be any black and red really. And then I'll just take the excess paint off on a tissue and stip all this on. It's a bit glossy at the minute, but when that dries matte, that should blend in lovely. Just use a little water here to rub off any dirt. Now with the propellers, I first of all have to unscrew the screw in the spinner to take them apart. And you can just replace the two blade prop. Or you can re-glue it. Obviously you have to make sure you fit it the correct way round. Now you can either super glue or use a contact adhesive such as Yuhu just to hold the thing in place while you glue it properly with an epoxy resin such as Araldite. So you have to get it the right way around in position. Now I'm going to give that just a moment just to go off a little bit, that contact adhesive. And then I should just be able to put it together and it hold. And that isn't exactly the right position. If you use super glue, be very careful you don't glue your fingers. Now that on its own is not strong enough for flight. But it does need a slither of epoxy resin around there just to strengthen it up, and then it is. But this gives me what I call flight props, and then I have display props, and the display props. I keep for when I'm displaying the model on my shelves. And then the flight props are for actual flying. And I've repaired this particular prop more than once. So I guess, because they do break quite often, I've saved myself tens of pounds actually. It's up to you. You can just buy tons of spare props if you want. And you have to mix this epoxy up really well and it will go off in about 10 minutes this particular version because it's a rapid version but the more you mix it up the better that's going to go off some chemicals like plastic padding or chemical metal isopon they don't need to be mixed quite as thoroughly and that exothermic reaction goes off it spreads throughout the material and it goes off really quickly. These epoxy glues, I think, need a bit more of a mix. Right, that should be good. And we'll just put a slither on each side. And then what I'll do is paint it up with some matte black paint. And that will do. And you know what? You can put this glue on just one prop, one side. It doesn't matter if it's got glue one side and not the other. It will not be significantly out of balance. The plane will still fly. So there we are. That is now gluing, as I say, I paint it matte black. Just spot that on with the brush. You could even spray it. And then that will look nice, ready for flight. I've actually got little orange dots I put under here. And that shows me whether it's been repaired easily at quick glance. 
and this prop has been repaired on both sides before so it's still going strong unless there's a big split or a chunk out of the prop I tend not to throw them away a little piece of matte black paint of course you don't need this I'm just doing it for completeness and most of that will be hidden anyway within the spinner it goes there that goes there screw it up and then we have another propeller nearly ready to flight just going to tidy up little areas here just to pull that all over this used to be a red prop so unfortunately there is some red showing through here and there so I usually just tidy it up a bit like that stipple the paint on or use my finger to stipple it on of course I'll wash my fingers straight away after and there we go a prop ready for action repaired it doesn't take long I tend to take the display prop off it just pulls off and I put on a different prop to fly this is a prop that's easier to get hold of and the display prop is particular to the Corsair so I'll look after that one so there's some information about the planes if you've got any more add them into the comments if you can and Let's go fly this thing. First of all, power on. That will beep. And then you have to carefully get the lead out of the plane. Plug that in. Now, you can hear it connected. Push the trim up, three peeps, and a little rudder twitch means that it's got U-turn enabled. I don't know if that will function. And up and down on the throttle finds it, and then again you should have thrust. And of course, it's got all of the other controls. You tuck this in. You have to find a way that suits you. you. Can end up quite a tight fit. That's gone in nicely though. Clip that in. And I wouldn't trim anything at the moment, even if the rudders and elevators and look out, they're probably not once you put it in the air. So wait until you put it in the air before you start trimming things. Okay, I carry my plane in there, and my controller, and my camera in there. Right, I'm currently in beginner mode, and that is as far as you can turn it. Pull over on right stick, same on left stick. Now I can get more turn if I use the rudder. This is left rudder at two, and you can see it's really tight. You don't have to use the rudder though. If you just want a nice full throttle or 80% throttle flight just on the right stick, and then you can go up and down, left and right. It's quite nice. So I've got the one touch aerobatics, so let's do roll come back and do one hopefully more in shot here we go it's nice and that really does go nicely on touch aerobatics now going to 
mid mode. And now the plane is much more lively. Got some, some F-15s. Probably, in many ways, the nicest mode because you've still got stability and uh, one touch function still function. That was a one touch loop. Might have gone out of shot there. But a try one touch loop over here, perhaps. Now I'll try and put it in expert mode and I'm flying into the wind so I'm going to put the speed down to 50% here we go, expert. And they're very tail heavy normally. It is flying. Oh, I've gone back to beginner. It doesn't fly for long. Some are better trimmed than others. The mesh of spit is really well trimmed. Expert. So I can fly. I find you fight the aircraft more than you fly it though, so I prefer it in beginner or mid mode. So I'm back in beginner mode. Another loop. I'll roll that one. The thing is, with one touch aerobatics, you really have to, if you want to do a loop, move it down. And you have to get it spot on, otherwise, you can do a loop. See, it picks up the left or right turn first. Okay, let's do a there we go, quite low to the ground, let's do this. Right. Can't believe these little foamies, the technology in them is great. They look good, they look scale, you know, I'm flying now at 50%. And this plane can look, if you fly it smoothly, on a day with little wind, it can look really, really good. It's not getting thrown about too much, is it? Just looks thing is you have to balance the throttle with the elevators in particular and also if you're turning on the ailerons that of course have an effect and that thud was the plane hit me on the shoulder and it didn't hurt the prop came off so I just clip that one A little crack there, so I need to glue that. Put, put that in, just put that in position now for flying, and then I can paint over that. And that, in the end, will not notice. I'll give it some throttle, make sure the prop don't fly. Off. You need to keep an eye on that prop in case it does. And we're ready again. gonna try that U-turn function. U-turn. It's trying to turn. It did a quarter of a turn. Let's try it again here. And it's doing a quarter of a turn. And then going out of control. Let's fly it towards myself. Nothing. So the U 
turn function. I've never found really functions very nicely on these planes. It's a bit of a dubious need anyhow. How about that? So let's try a full throttle fly past. Here we go. Slow speed flying. Things a lot nice in slow motion. They just fly so nicely. The technology is helping you fly just fine in that wind. But you are having to fly, it won't fly itself. So you can't give it to a three year old. It's good flight though. Kids could fly, he says, as he hits the ground. Prop came off. Let's clip that back on. Now the prop saver on there, they do give you another one in the box, and you have to take that off with pliers off the motor mount, literally pull it off and push it on. It only goes on one way, there's a flat on one side on the shaft of the motor that lines up with the inside of the prop saver, as they call it. So you'll need to get that lined up for it to fully go on, otherwise it won't fully go on, your prop will stick out a little. The two bladers people say give you optimum performance, I've found no difference between the two and the three, but I think the two blades are less prone to damage as it lands, it's more likely to flatten out, especially if it's not on power. So your props are normally safe. Three blades though, more likely, more prone to damage because there's every 120 degrees as a prop. Still. We're off. hit the tripod on the wing. There's no damage at all. See if you hit the tripod with a normal aircraft, it's going to probably be in pieces unless it's made of foam itself. And even then, it will fly faster, it'll probably knock the camera over. Way more weight. These at 60 grams under the 250 gram limit. Really safe. When you land, always look for your props first. Perhaps any wheels and anything else, just in case they've fallen off. They're hard to find otherwise. They're just fun flying in such a small area to. And there we are, landed, and we've actually landed nicely. 